Welcome, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, be welcoming back Prof Professor Hugh Roberts to campus. We're pleased to uh, we were pleased to host him here um, back in February 2011, in the midst of the e Egyptian Revolution. Actually, I think we hosted him here maybe two days before Mubarak um, uh, stepped down, and so um, it was an exciting time, a tense time, and at that time he gave us uh, an overview of Algeria and the likelihood or the non-likelihood of Algeria following suit of, uh, after Tunisia and Egypt. Today he'll be providing further insight into the opposition in Algeria and whether we can expect a revolution there anytime soon. Um, just a, a brief introduction for Professor uh, Roberts and, and his work. He is currently the Edward Keller Professor of North African and Middle Eastern History at Tufts University and is heading the Middle East Studies Department there. He received his academic training, BA, Masters, and PhD at uh, Oxford University, where he did his doctoral research on Algeria and continued to focus on Algeria in his uh, scholarly work thereafter. He's published widely on Algerian issues, and his publications include um, Algerian Socialism and the Kabila Question, published in 1981, The Battlefield, Algeria, 1988 to 2002, Studies in a Broken Polity, published in 2003, and is currently working on a book uh, forthcoming, hopefully by the end of this year, Berber Government, the Kabili Polity in Pre-Colonial Algeria. He's held several academic positions with the School of Development Studies at the University of East Anglia, Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex, the London School of Economics, University of California, Berkeley, and School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Before moving to our area to take his current position at Tufts University earlier this year, he was based in Cairo, uh, where he continued his work on Algeria as well as research on Egyptian political history and the history of Islamism in North Africa, and working for the International Crisis Group there as the director of its North Africa project in 2002 to 2007, and again from January to July of 2011. We're very pleased to have uh, Professor Roberts move to our area, but also very pleased and lucky to have him uh, with us today to give us insight on Algeria. Please join me in welcoming Professor Roberts. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to be back here at the uh, to speak. Uh, at the Kennedy School under the aegis of the Middle East Initiative. It gives me an opportunity to uh, go into a bit more detail than I have been able to do for some time uh, on what is happening in Algeria. Um, and I want really today to focus on an aspect of the situation that I think uh, certainly needs to be brought into focus uh, in the Algerian case and possibly in other cases, namely the particular character of what we uh, rather uh, hastily refer to as the opposition in these countries, um, particularly where transitions of some kind or other are being envisaged uh, and uh, outcomes are not necessarily being calculated with realism. So let me uh, see if this works and see if I can read my own writing here. Um, Part of what I'm going to say is a little contrary. As I imagine you're aware, insofar as Algeria has been discussed at all over the last 18 months, uh, two years, since January of 2011, of course people have had lots of other places to discuss, but insofar as it's been discussed, it's been discussed really as the exception, as the odd man out, uh, as the country that has not had its Arab Spring. And well, I mean, you can read as well as I can. You probably don't need me to read what's there. I mean, the point is that explanations have been put forward uh, to explain what is, in a sense, regarded as not simply an exception, but a disappointment um, in terms of uh, the memory of the 1990s, the terrible violence that uh, uh, 
uh, ravaged Algeria over that decade. Um, the Algerian authorities, being uh, um, motivated in part by self-respect, have had this other uh, response to the question, which is that Algeria is, in fact, uh, a precursor, not a laggard, is a pioneer, has been through this movie long ago. Uh, and, of course, that's an answer that uh, is, uh, takes care of Algerian amour propre. The question is, do people buy it? And what do we think of it? Oops, I've lost the thing altogether. Um, here we go. Now, I was particularly struck following the end of Gaddafi's state um, last year that part elements of the Western media started talking about Algeria as if it's the next in line, the next one to go. And the point is, of course, the next what? Um, and this linked into uh, expressions of disappointment or... or um, uh, impatience that the Algerians hadn't risen up against their re regime. And I want to suggest that that, that actually began to establish a distinction uh, between different conceptions of the Arab Spring. One, the original one, it seemed to me, for the people of Tunisia and Egypt and elsewhere, that this was uh, arising, expressing and affirming self-respect, demanding dignity, uh, demanding a change uh, a, a major change in the character of the relationship between state and society, that this was above all about the pursuit of dignity, with all that that might imply in terms of substantive citizenship uh, and all kinds of uh, curbs on the despotic and, or arbitrary uh, powers of the state. It seems to me that there's been a real shift to the idea that the Arab Spring is above all about regime change, preferably of a spectacular uh, or even violent kind. And so I think that that's a point worth making about Algeria because that shift in the conception of the Arab Spring or that replacement of one conception by a different one uh, is a premise of Western impatience with Algeria for having failed to have an Arab Spring in the sense of getting rid uh, of the regime. So... Just, I mean, you can read that, but the, the, the point is that the, this means that the problem of the Algerian exception is the problem of explaining Algerians' failure to get rid of their rulers. And it's interesting to note that the Algerian officialdom's response to the problem, to, the, to Western taxing with failure, actually shares the premise. Um, it accepts that the Arab Spring is about regime change, it is about rising up against rulers in a violent way, but they are able to say, well, we had it in 1988 when there were nationwide riots in October of that year that definitely were focusing on the then head of state, President Chadli ben Shadid, that were expressing massive popular hostility to his position as president um, and did lead to a substantive change in the political system. Uh, several months later, the introduction of a new constitution, putting an end to the old system of the one-party uh, monopoly and introducing political pluralism. So the Algerian response, although in my view disingenuous, um, does contain an element of truth. Okay. Now, the point I want to make is that the alleged failure is in itself actually a myth. Algerians have been rising up all the time, um, as we'll see in a moment, uh, in the sense that there has been massive and, and constant unrest. Algeria is a country where there are riots happening every day. Official figures for these riots, which you may choose not to trust, uh, uh, estimated them for one year alone, the year 2010 to 2011, as at around 10,000 riots. Think about that. There are, there are m numerous riots happening every day of the week, somewhere. Algerian society is in a state of constant self-activation against the authorities in some sense. What hasn't happened is a rising focus on the person of the president, Bouteflika, trying to get rid of him. And the two good reasons for this is, first of all, is a reason that it seems to me has just simply not been properly taken on board in Western discussion, which is that the Algerian state is quite unlike Ben Ali's Tunisia or Mubarak's Egypt. It's not an autocracy. It's an oligarchy. And that's a very important fact because it has this implication that changing the president won't change the system. The Algerians have become aware of that. They've learned a lot over... They've been on a le painful learning curve over the last 20 years and they are well aware that getting rid of the president 
the oligarchy will simply make someone else president and then business as usual. And the second good reason is that Bouteflika, <laughs> irritating this may be to, the, um, to those people who really want to see regime change everywhere, Bouteflika is not actually very unpopular. On the contrary, he's actually fairly popular, not with the intelligentsia, but with ordinary Algerians. And there's an excellent reason for that. He is credited, rightly or wrongly, with having put an end to the nightmare of the 90s. He did that fairly quickly, having become president in 1999. Within a year, most of the mainstream armed Islamic organizations had agreed to dissolve themselves, which meant that the violence was reduced uh, to a very, very low level, confined to certain pockets, mainly the Kabylia region in the north, and from 2003 onwards, the far south, uh, bordering the Sahel, meaning that the rest of the country was largely now free of it. And that has meant Bouteflika has been appreciated. Okay. I want to suggest that the, 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 the pertinent question is the one that the misstatement of the problem doesn't allow us to ask, which was, given that there has been a lot of relentless popular um, unrest and contestation in various forms, including riots and other forms of direct action, why has this failed to translate into genuine reform? And I want to suggest that uh, there are two real reasons. It's not so much that the regime has acted in a way that uh, rules this out. Uh, it's partly the national security character of the state, and that's a point that I'll come back to a little. But the one I want to focus on is the true nature of what people refer to as the opposition in Algeria. And that's really what this talk is about. Um, let me just quickly uh, add to my point that, in fact, uh, popular unrest is virtually endemic and permanent or constant in Algeria. Um, we can distinguish three periods. There was the period of the 80s, culminating in the spectacular nationwide nationwide riots of, 19, of October 1988. And that, this was uh, rioting uh, unrest generated by the character of the evolution of the regime under President Shadley, uh, an evolution that took it away from the policy perspectives and the forms of behavior of the Boumediene era. Um, uh, and uh, generated a great deal of popular hostility to what the Algerians call le pouvoir assulta. Uh, then, after the long hiatus of the violence, which of course ruled out uh, non-military forms of, of protest and contestation, following the return of relative peace, following, if you like, the success of Bouteflika in putting the fires out, to use his own phrase, we find a resumption of popular contestation in the form of demonstrations, marches, and riots beginning uh, in Kabylia in 2001 and continuing for the next decade. Obviously, what has been happening over the last year and a half can be seen as a continuation of that, but the point is it's been happening in this new context of a region-wide uh, process of contestation of regimes, so arguably we're in a third period since uh, January 2011. Now, it's worth noting that not only has this unrest been, if you like, endemic and constant, but it has also been changing in character in an interesting way. In the riots of October 1988, it was purely male, mostly young men, adolescents, boy, uh, boys. It was basically young men for the age of 12 to 25. Uh, as one observer put it, uh, it reminded him of the demonstrations against the French at the end of the Algerian War without the women, with the women left out, because women did demonstrate against the French in 1960. Uh, what we've seen is women taking part. Uh, this is a, an image of October 1988. You'll only see men in this picture. Sorry, it's a rather uh, not very clear image, but it may convey an idea of what was going on in terms of uh, ravaging the city. Uh, this is the kind of damage that was done. If we look at more recent... Following following those riots, we had Chadley introducing pluralism under his Prime Minister Mulud Hamroush, who was succeeded by Sid Ahmed Ghazali. We'll, it's useful to bear that element of the political history in mind. Um, what's happened? And here's Bouteflika, for those of you who aren't familiar with what he looks like. And just 
to bring in the army by uh, uh, briefly, you, of course, the current leadership in Algeria includes this man. It's the only photograph available of him um, that I'm aware of. No doubt he has a family album somewhere. Um, but anyway, this, uh, well, one cannot pretend that Bouteflika runs Algeria. He's the president. But uh, the pouvoir sultan, of course, the central pillar of it, uh, is the army and, above all, the military intelligence uh, networks controlled since 1990 by Tufik, Lieutenant General Mohamed Medien, just so that you're aware of that very important aspect of reality. Um, this is the kind of, uh, this is the sort of image of uh, unrest in Algeria. This was the, the famous Black March in Tizi Ouzou, the capital of the Berber region of Kabylia, in May 2001, uh, following uh, the killing of, uh, getting on for 100, the ultimate death toll, toll was 100, over 120 young men by the gendarmes under orders to shoot to kill in riots uh, in April, May, and again in June of that year. Um, and that demonstration, you, you cannot actually see that there are women in it, but there were contingents of women in that march. And if we look at subsequent images, this was a subsequent march generated by the same drama in, Algeri in Algiers, when you had over a million people demonstrating in Algiers uh, in June 2001. Uh, that, here's uh, some images of women demonstrators, and this is an evolution in, the, if you like, the social character breaking down old taboos that defined uh, politics as a purely male affair and particularly defined violent activity or, or, or uh, dangerous activity as something for men alone. That's, that, that has all gone. We see women taking part. Uh, here we see an image of women and men in the same demonstration. We're seeing mixed contingents, if you like. This is a further step uh, in an evolution. Um, this is not a violent demonstration. It's not really particularly political. It's an affirmation of the, of the Amazigh identity in a fairly relaxed and friendly spirit. Here, a demonstration more recently in the context of the Arab Spring in Algiers. And as you can see, women and men demonstrating together uh, in uh, if what one might call an entirely modern fashion. Uh, so I just wanted you to be aware, and there again, but that's, of course, in Marseille, um, but around the same time, o aware of that Evolution, an evolution that the regime has kept pace with by training women policemen. Uh, so uh, when it needs to repress, it needs to arrest uh, women demonstrators, the regime has got smart. It's trained women uh, riot police to deal with that, as this image demonstrates. Okay, now, the Algerians, instead of talking about how the president has to go, Ben Ali or Mubarak. They talk about the system has to go. <coughs> this has become the new term. And of course, it in itself is indicative of, of the problem that I'm talking about today. Because of course, it's an abstraction. It's vague. It's nebulous. What exactly does it mean? Um, and one thing that, that strikes me about the way the term is used in the discourse of Algerian um, uh, opposition politics is that there isn't recognition that the system that is generating the unrest in the country, leading millions of Algerians, but in small cohorts at different moments in different localities, to enter into direct action against, against the regime in some sense, against the authorities. The system in question is actually very recent. It's no longer the one-party system put in place in 1962. It is actually the system established by the regime in the 90s itself, as a second try at making a pluralist formula workable. The point is that the first try led to landslide victories by the Islamist party, the Islamic Salvation Front, in 1990 and 1991. The army decided they couldn't live with those results, uh, organized a coup, deposed President Shadley, used Shadley's absence as a pretext for cancelling the second round of the elections, banned the Islamists who had just won the first round. That led to a nightmarish spiral of violence. It took them five years to get to the point where they felt they could and should try to return to some kind of constitutional political life with fresh elections. The function of the 1997 elections was, of course, to efface the memory of the embarrassing elections that they had cancelled. And the point about that is that in 1997, they concocted a new formula of, if you like, managed pluralism. And that's the system that has been 
uh, actually uh, operating uh, right up until now. It's a modification of the pluralist form, and it involves these features, the use of, of uh, proportional representation, the use of multi-member constituencies, party list systems, and at least two of everything. And by that I mean two government parties, two Islamist parties, if not more, two left-wing parties from the Marxist tradition, and at least two parties from the, uh, those uh, awkward customers, the Berbers of Kabylia. At the same time, you have a system of presidential rule. You have what are called presidential elections, but they're not elections. The real election happens long before, in secret. The president is chosen by a secret electoral college whose precise membership uh, we, we're never told. It remains it's not in the public domain, uh, nor when it meets. But everybody knows that come the so-called election, there is the candidate who's going to win, who's ne who is known in advance. In B it's Buda Flika in 1999, in 2004, in 2009. Before that, in 1995, it was his predecessor, the Amin Zerwa. There wasn't a single Algerian, I think, who was unaware of this basic fact about the proceedings. And then you have all the other candidates who are not going to win. And you can't even call them all so rans because there isn't a race. They are, as the Algerians themselves say, ils font de la figuration. They're there for form's sake. In fact, they perform functions that are useful to the regime, above all the function of increasing the turnout. People, the turnout is higher because of certain candidates are there that people can vote for to express themselves. In other words, a good deal of the voting is not instrumental but expressive. And that way you get a larger turnout than you have anyway. But the point is these aren't elections. And you have a parliament of a kind, it's something called a parliament, but its crucial fact is that it's dominated by a three-party coalition, the old national party, the FLN, the new party brought, created in 1997. Similarly, like the FLN, a party created by the regime from on high, in other words, in effect, a state apparatus, called the uh, Rassemblement National Démocratique, Democratic National Rally. It's not democratic. It's not really very national, and it doesn't really rally anybody, but never mind, it's there. It's, it's regarded by the FLN as its younger brother. Um, and then you have the third party, the MSP, which is the kind of the house Islamists, the tame Islamists. These are the Algerian counterpart of the Muslim brothers, except that in the Algerian case, they have not been in long-standing opposition to the regime and banned. They've been legal and co-opted. They're recognized by the Egyptian brothers as their Algerian counterpart, but they've been following a strategy of accepting co-optation and have actually had portfolios in every Algerian government since 1996. So it's a, it's a particular formula, but it's a formula that means that between them, these three parties are always constituting a majority, a permanent majority, and that has consequences for what there can be in, this, in the way of an opposition. Let me just show you some images rather than a lot of text. This is the current uh, Secretary General of the Party of the FLN. I'm going to sort of take you at great speed through a kind of rogues gallery of the Algerian political uh, elite. This is Abdul Aziz Belkhadem. This is the head of the younger party, the party that the FLN complained uh, was born wearing its moustache. Il est né avec sa moustache. Ahmed Oyakia. Uh, Belkhadem, the man I've just shown you, is from the west of Algeria and is regarded as a kind of um, a crypto-Islamist. That's to say he's from the, the wing of the FLN that is close in outlook to those Islamists that aren't about fighting the regime but are, are about influencing its programs. Well, Yahya is from Kabylia and uh, is a kind of classic uh, <laughs> public servant, commis uh, d'état, a classic... Uh, he's not really a politician... Uh, he's um, a servant of the state and he's been prime minister three times and then there's the third uh, musketeer the uh, founder of the tame Islamist party the MSP, MSP stands for it's a French acronym Movement of Society for Peace this party was originally known as Hamas um, but uh, that, um, standing for the Arabic not uh, resistance uh, but uh, <coughs> uh, Harakat li Mujtama Islami, Movement for an Islamic Society. In 1996, the constitutional revision obliged all the Islamist parties to take the word Islamic out of their names. So they renamed themselves um, 
حركة المجتمع السني حركة المجتمع السني which translates into MSP um, Nahna died uh, a little unexpectedly uh, but naturally um, I think it was in 2005 and this and it was succeeded by Bulgara Soltani who has been leading the MSP in the coalition ever since now the system is a system that generates discontent and protest. And this is what needs to be understood about the system established in 1997. Given the built-in majority of the three-party coalition, there can be no alternance, there can be no change of government as a result of elections. Therefore, elections do not have as their function uh, or their, their agenda a, a government change. What is at issue is changes in the relative balance of, advan of advantage uh, between the parties in the governing coalition, which one is, get, has the most seats, which one can, in a sense, be top dog in the coalition for the next five years. And similarly, the balance of advantage amongst all the other parties that are not going to be, that do not aspire to be, and, and are not, in any case, going to be, co-opted into the, into the coalition. Um, <clears throat> now that means the parties that are not in the majority can never hope to be in government unless they accept co-optation, which may not be on offer in any case. Uh, it may be on offer in some cases and not in others. But that's the only way for them to, be, to get into government. And since most of them know that, that it's not, there's no question of this, this means that they have absolutely no incentive to think constructively about what the programme of government should be. And they don't, as a result. They don't have serious thought-out programs for government. They are basically parties with their single-issue movements calling themselves political parties, or they're parties with a limited number of issues, usually issues to do with identity. The Islamic identity for those Islamist parties that have certain bees in their bonnet uh, and don't want to be co-opted. The Berber identity for the parties from Kabylia. Um, what the single issues are for the parties that come from the left-wing Marxist tradition is, is not really quite so clear, but it tends to be hostility to globalisation uh, and some, at any rate, rhetorical interest in the fate of the working class. But that doesn't go very far. Now, the other aspect is that the, the consequences of the multi-member constituencies. The elections that produced such dramatic and unmanageable results in 1991 were single-member constituencies. They were constituencies like we have in Britain. Uh, and I think like... I mean, you have sing No, you don't have single-member constituencies. Do you have single-member constituencies here? Yeah. You're not sure. Anyway, never mind. The point is that they were relatively small constituencies, and what the regime did in 1997 is to say, right, forget all that. From now on, the administrative region, which in Algeria is known as the Wilaya, is the constituency for uh, parliamentary elections which means that each wilaya sends something between half a dozen to maybe more than a dozen, and maybe as many as 20 or so, deputies to the National Assembly, all elected at wilaya level. And they're elected depending on not simply uh, how many votes their party gets in that wilaya, but where they are located on the party's list. And that is the decisive question. It is the choice, it's, it is the party leader's who choose uh, where, you, where a candidate will figure on the list. If they're on first, second, third, fourth place, they're, they're contenders. Lower than that, they're also rams. They're not contenders. Uh, and the fact that so many deputies are elected from the wilaya means that the individual deputies have no real relationship to their, to their constituents. And the electors cannot really feel that they have put someone in parliament. And as a result, there is no close relationship between the representative and the represented. And the fact is that deputies, by and large, do not perform a representative function, and electors are not represented. There is a representation deficit in this system. This is a system that empowers the party leaderships, makes them the key actors, and, of course, the party leaderships exist on license from the regime, whatever party we're talking about. Okay, uh, so there's this problem in the system. Oops, what have we got? Uh, all right. So I've already made that point. What this means is that, uh, just to develop this aspect of it, that a major aspect of the discourse of what we could call, for sake of, uh, just for, for simplicity at this stage, opposition parties or non-government parties, is about legitimacy. 
They are not contenders for government. They don't have programs for government. But they have a discourse that is about maintaining their, their constituency by maintaining a critical discourse on government in the language of legitimacy. That the, the, the regime is illegitimate for various reasons, one of which is that maybe it doesn't give sufficient recognition to the Amazigh identity and the, the language and other demands that go with it, or it doesn't give sufficient expression to the Islamic di uh, identity and the various things that uh, are said to derive from that in the sphere of law and the sphere of morals, the sphere of social policy, and so on. Uh, whatever uh, the uh, angle of attack, uh, the, the substance of the argument and the discourse is one that uh, attacks the regime's claim to be legitimate, that puts that under pressure, and in doing so uh, affirms uh, a rival legitimacy, the legitimacy of the party and the tradition it comes out of. Um, at the same time, uh, because there's a plurality of Islamist parties, a plurality of Kabyle parties, a plurality of left-wing parties, there's, there's a, a discourse of legitimacy that is about rivalry within this limited uh, uh, part of the ballpark, um, particularly noticeable in the case of the, the competing discourses of the parties in Kabylia. Um, so uh, a great deal of the energy rhetorical and organizational energy of the parties that are non-government parties is actually about maintaining their relative share of the limited vote for their particular brand of uh, 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 legitimacy discourse, whether it's Berberist or Islamist or whatever. Um, okay, and the MSP, because it participates in government, it has benefits in terms of a piece of the patronage game, but it, it's vulnerable because uh, it, is, it, it, takes, it has to bear its share of the targeting of all the government parties by the rest of the non-government parties. And this means that it, it puts it under pressure and is inclined to splinter. And this, as a, this has, in fact, happened. This is a picture of uh, the leader of a splinter from the MSP. Okay. Um, I'm going to very... don't expect you to make sense of all that, but the, I just want to make one quick point about the Islamists. Um, there is this character, um, Abdullah Jabala. It may be that um, I'm, s I'm going to be a little simplistic. He has developed the one brand of political Islamism in Algeria that I think the regime has found it hardest to cope with. The regime has actually known how to cope with the jihadis. It's fought them. It's dealt with them in an absolutely ruthless way. Let's not go into all the horrors of the 90s today. But, I mean, utterly ruthless. Uh, in dealing with armed, uh, armed groups. And then there's the, the Islamists that uh, are basically uh, peddling a relatively limited agenda that accept that Al the Algerian state is in some sense sufficiently uh, legitimate in Islamic terms, but that there the needs to be uh, pressure maintained and are willing to do that from within the tent. In other words, the MSP, the co-opted Islamists. What the regime hasn't really liked is having to cope with this guy, because... The point about Jabala is that he refused to be part of the feast back in 1989-90. He, he knew better than to get involved in that adventure. He stayed out of it. He developed his own brand of peaceful, constitutional, entirely law-abiding political Islamism that did not seek co-optation and actively re resisted being co-opted because it actually had an interesting reform agenda. And this is a brand of Islamism that actually had some mileage in terms of the Algerian ele uh, electorate I'll skip the details, but the point is the way the regime handled this is that they couldn't really tolerate it, and they dealt with it by repeatedly destabilizing him, by manipulating uh, fault lines within his, the successive parties that he has founded in order constantly to, if you like, knock over his bricks. He has won some spectacular election victories and then within a year or two been destabilized by splits that almost certainly have happened with assistance from... Uh, Lieutenant General Medien's uh, Mukhabarat. Uh, so the one thing that the Algerian regime has not allowed to develop is actually something that might have been really quite interesting. A, it's a seriously reformist uh, brand of non-co-opted Islamist opposition. The regime has not wanted that to happen. Um, and this is one of the people who has been, uh, has risen, it's not a good photo. Um, one of the parties that Jabala founded was called al Islah. He lost control of it. He lost control of an earlier party when it won very big in the elections. The point is that other people were manipulated to... Um, so we have 
a kind of proliferation of, of Islamists. The regime has actively promoted uh, a proliferation of Islamists. Uh, and of course, this has been about uh, dividing and ruling. And it's been at the expense of, of a line of development that might have been quite interesting. I think that Jabala was trying to do something interesting and constructive, and the regime has not wanted that to get anywhere. If we look at the Kabyles, we have the two main parties, the Front des Forces Socialistes, founded in 1963 as a, as a rebellion against Ahmed Ben Bala, just after independence, and led, since then legalized in 1989, and led from that day to this by Hossein Ait Ahmed, one of the founders of the FLN in 1954, a grand old man, a, a historic, as the Algerians say, uh, and uh, um, uh, but uh, and, uh, the perfect uh, illustration of what the Algerians call Zaymism, that's to say the, uh, an aspect of the Algerian syndrome, meaning that uh, parties uh, are led uh, by, by, un by immovable uh, leaders year in, year out. And in fact, it's interesting that it is the opposition parties that are characterized by Zaymism more than uh, the, the pro-government or government-sponsored parties. In the FLN, we see, in fact, fairly frequent changes of leadership at the top. There's been a number of people who've been secretary general. But Ait Ahmed, it's, uh, what is it, 37, 49 years now uh, that he has been running the FFS. Uh, <coughs> the RCD started, kind of was a splinter from the FFS, similarly exhibiting the Zionist syndrome with Said Saadi being leader of it from its foundation in 1989. Uh, right through to this year when he suddenly, surprisingly, stepped down. Uh, most people seem to think that that's because he's positioning himself to be a serious contender, so he would like to uh, hope uh, in the presidential elections uh, scheduled for 2014. And one of the important facts about presidential elections, apart from the fact that they're not elections and they are actually decided in advance, is that um, if you actually want to be a serious contender, actually you really want to be considered by the electoral college, the secret electoral college of the decideurs, the deciders who actually do the electing, you cannot be associated with one narrow party point of view. You have to be able to be presented as a, a rassembleur, as an Algerian who can uh, appeal to everybody. And that may explain Said Saadi's sudden decision to resign the leadership of the RCD uh, someone may have suggested to him that he would have a chance if he did this. We'll see whether that is the truth. Um, the point I want to make is that in Kabylia, which is a, a region close to Algiers, within one hour driving east out of Algiers, you're in Kabylia. It's a very beautiful region, very mountainous, the most densely populated place in North Africa, uh, with the sole exception, perhaps, of the Nile Delta. It's a very remarkable place. Uh, it was a storm center of the National Revolution. It's produced an extraordinary number of elites, uh, notably uh, Ahmadou Yahya as a sort of classic instance of the civilian technocrat. Kabili has produced lo lots of those. It's the only person in Algeria who's been prime minister three times. And that rather sinister figure, that grainy photograph, Lieutenant Colonel Medien, General Medien, also a Kabil. It's a striking fact about Kabili that it has produced some of the most vigorous and angry opposition, while at the same time producing the people who are actually running things. Mm -hmm. Uh, running the intelligence services, running a good deal of the media, running the government. Um, so that's part of the complexity of Algerian politics. <clears throat> the point I want to make is that Kabila had its own parties from 1989 onwards, but they have been in, engaged in this duel. Uh, and a long-term result of that is the disaffection of the previously very politicized Kabila electorate. Uh, that you'll, you'll see that... Uh, uh, there's been a, a growing tendency in, in Kabila itself uh, not to bother to vote ordinary people I'm talking about, given the recognition that the, the two parties from the region that have had uh, such prominence have actually been so absorbed in their own rivalry that they've uh, and, and limited to permanent uh, non uh, permanent <coughs> opposition in the sense of non participation in government that Kabila's have got absolutely nothing from this, the, and so there's. Kabila is, in a sense, led uh, the way towards uh, disaffection and disenchantment with the political system. And one expression of that in Kabila is the growth of this newer movement, the MAC, uh, that is, in a sense, expressing uh, Kabila's giving up on ever democratizing the political system of the Algerian state as a whole and investing what I think is a vain hope in the, um, in the very different 
uh, vision of autonomy. And that, uh, that's a, a development that, in my view, is actually quite dangerous. OK, here's the, the rogues gallery for Kabilia, Hossein Akhtar Ahmed. And here's uh, Hossein Akhtar Ahmed more recently. He's now in his 80s. Here's Saad Saadi, uh, who's in his 60s. And uh, well, we needn't worry about him. And here's uh, Ferhat Mahani, the founder of the MAC, who is also just in his, just moved into his 60s. Previously a very, very popular singer. And the question is whether he can be taken seriously in any other um, uh, walk of life. All right, now the left, we have Louisa Hanoun. It's worth thinking <coughs> that it's the first woman to lead a political party in the Arab world. Uh, and the first woman to stand for the presidency of the, of the Republic in the Arab world. Um, leader of the Workers' Party, which is a party of Trotskyist pedigree. But like the leaders of the other parties, she's been leading it ever since it was founded. It's now 22 years. And so the Zionism syndrome is apparent in the case of, of Algerian Trotskyism, as in the case of Algerian Islamism and Algerian Berberism and everything else. Um, and she is now regarded by many people as, in effect, having also been co-opted by the, by the regime. Her party doesn't have government portfolios, but she has been a notable supporter of President Bouteflika at crucial junctures over the last five or six years. Now, um, I think that I need to hurry up. Uh, even though I started at what, about 10 past? So I think I've got another, at least another five minutes. Um, one of, okay, the, the point about these images is that they show this Jabala <coughs> Hamrush, who you may remember, the young prime minister back in 1989 who brought in the, the new pluralism, Ait Ahmed. Um, there have been attempts, there have been gestures by Algerian opposition parties and personalities at the idea of transcending all this disunity at important moments in alliances. We saw this in 1999, where these three and um, a couple of other candidates were able to agree on one thing, withdrawing from the election, <laughs> which arguably is not a terribly constructive alliance. Um, and here's uh, Ait Ahmed and Hamush again with a third uh, personality, uh, Abdul Hamid Mehri, who sadly died a few months ago, who was a leading uh, figure, an elder statesman from the FLN tradition. And they uh, would their alliance took the form of issuing, in a sense, joint communiques at intervals, uh, but not really getting beyond that. Uh, here it, we saw, during the last elections, an attempt by the MSP, uh, in conjunction with two smaller Islamist parties, to establish a, an electoral alliance called the Green Alliance, um, which did actually function as an alliance for the purposes of the election, but this wasn't a great success. But it might, the point I'm making is that, by and large, uh, the Algerian opposition have been very, very um, bad at forming functional alliances. Uh, it's not really been in their repertoire, and such alliances as have been attempted have been uh, really rather shallow, flimsy affairs with little real effect. Now, <clears throat> I think, uh, yeah, I think <coughs> what I'm going to do in the five minutes that remain is forget about what's there and just ad lib. Um, I want to give you two more interesting people to look at. This is Ali, uh, Ali Yahya Abdanur, uh, um, a grand old man of, of uh, the Algerian uh, human rights movement, founder of the Algerian League for the Defense of Human Rights, and his successor, Mostafa Bouchashi, a distinguished uh, human rights lawyer. They have come into the action uh, in the wake of the riots in uh, January 2011, forming something called the CNCD, that's the French acronym, the National Coordination for Democratic Change, or in some versions, um, for change and democracy. Uh, and the point here is that this is a form of oppositional activism, notionally concerned with reform, inspired by what one might call a liberal democratic uh, ideological vision, that has sought to make some headway, to uh, make some mileage, in the wake of the uh, striking riots, that the first riots to take place across the nation, all at the same time, in January uh, 2011. Uh, and the reason why I've, in a sense, fast forwarded to this, I've given you the background, because I didn't think I could take it for granted that everybody uh, here would have uh, that uh, data on, on the complexity and the degree of diversity, the degree of pluralism in Algeria. Um, but 
What I really want to say concerns really what's happened over the last 18 months. This is where we're getting to, we're finally cutting to the chase, if you like. Um, in January 2011, there were riots across the country for the first time since 1988. So it was really quite a spectacular development that took a lot of people by surprise. And um, the CNCD was set up by Mustafa Bouchashi, the, the successor to the old man, Abdul Nur Ali Yahya, running the Human Rights League, uh, together with uh, people from certain associations that are particularly combative on issues arising out of the war, such as the associations concerned with the question of the disappeared. Thousands of Algerians disappeared during the war. And, of course, the regime is not about to uh, explain what happened to them. And then there's the, the other fairly combative associations, victims of terrorism and so forth. Uh, and a th another element that is, in my view, one of the most interesting elements in the Algerian uh, situation uh, the new independent trade unions that have been developing over the last decade. Some of these came together, coordinated and orchestrated by uh, Bouchashi in particular, to found the CNCD as a movement that was not a political party, that was agitating with a democratic agenda in the immediate aftermath of these very uh, spectacular and very destructive uh, violent riots that fortunately did not have a terrible death toll, in part because the Algerian riot police were under very, very strict orders not to use force, not to shoot. Uh, uh, it's really very striking. Only five deaths across the country during riots that were extremely violent and lasted six or seven days. Uh, and that's a, um, so there's been this evolution on the state side of things in terms of the, how it conducts itself, coping with unrest. Now. What they tried to do, they made an issue, first of all, of the fact that Algeria has been under a state of emergency since 1992. Uh, and uh, they made that the centerpiece of their agitation, a repeal of the state of emergency, the premise of that being that the state of emergency constitutes a major constraint on normal democratic political activity. And that's the first thing that has to go. And they were then hoist with their own petard, caught out by the <coughs> regime's clearly unexpected decision to concede this demand. Within a very short time, the regime had decided, okay, we're repeating the state of emergency. Well, hello. And the point is, they didn't know what to do next. The CNCD did not know what to do next. And it promptly split in two, which, of course, is what Algerian opposition movements do. <laughs> they, they find that easy. Uh, the sort of slightest pretext, they were split in two. And we had the CNCD Bouchashi, and the CNCD Said Saadi, the point here being that the Berberist movement, the Berberist party, the Said Saadi's party, the, the RCD, had entered the CNCD, had agreed to be part of it and support it, whereas Ait Ahmed's FFS had boycotted it for precisely the, the reason that Said Saadi's movement was in it. The FFS would not be in it. This is a necessary element of party political product differentiation. So the CNCD splits, and it splits on the issue of whether or not to continue to demonstrate in Algiers when, uh, despite the repeal of the state of emergency, the government locally is imposing a ban on demonstrations in Algiers and continuing to do so. Said Saadi and his uh, supporters insist that maintaining the decision to demonstrate in Algiers was the strategy. Bouchashi and co. saying, no, 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 uh, we're not going to do this, waste of time, we'll just get our heads broken for nothing. We're going to conduct meetings in halls uh, that, are, uh, that are authorized to give our message to the people how there can be change and it can be peaceful. Now, the point here is that both of these uh, strategic perspectives turned out to be completely futile. Completely futile. They both led nowhere. Uh, and they led nowhere for different reasons, but the, in both cases, I want to suggest they exhibited, they illustrated the limits on the imagination and the political repertoire of these forces trying to conduct an agitation and actually not managing to conduct a successful one. What's very, very striking, and you'll have to sort of, I'm in a sense asking you to just to take my word for it, about Bouchashi's discourse from that point onwards, given that the demand to repeal the state of emergency had been repealed, had, had been conceded, is that from then on, all he had to say was, we must have un changement and democracy and this can be peaceful and we'll say it in halls that have been we've been authorized to use for the purpose of saying this and the point is that this is a message without content 
Why should Algerians give up their free evenings to, to go and listen to someone telling them that there must be a change? That isn't actually, they're not learning anything. It's not providing them with any orientation. It's just, as the Algerians would say, brushing the wind. Now, the Saitadi thing arguably had a little bit more purpose to it, heroically insisting on trying to exercise the right to demonstrate against the massed forces of the Algerian riot police. I think I put in a picture here. Uh, no, no, it's all gone. I forgot to put other. I had some nice pictures of masses of riot police. Anyway, the point is that the reason for that strategy was that it was premised on the French media showing interest in getting those images and putting them on French television. And to persist in this strategy after February, March 2011 was ridiculous because, of course, the French media had far bigger fish to fry in Libya, in Syria, Egypt, Tunisia, wherever. A f uh, 35 people demonstrating surrounded by 1,000 riot police in Algiers was small beer by comparison with, with the other things that the French media had to, to put on their screens. So the French showed no interest. And the point is that it was a strategy predicated on external interest uh, that couldn't be sustained in the absence of external interest. OK, so let me wrap up with the final conclusions. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm missing stuff out. We don't actually have an opposition in Algeria. It's a misuse of language to talk about opposition. The parties that are not in government, that do not aspire to be in government, uh, but simply aspire to be part of the game, part of the scenery, to have a, a bit of action, some lines to speak in the Algerian political theatre. They are not engaging in opposition. They're, they're engaging in what we could dignify with the term dissent. They are dissenters from whatever the government orthodoxy happens to be at a particular time. They are uh, uh, in, 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 in they're arguably performing a, a useful function from the point of view of the Algerian state. They're providing the function of safety valve. They're providing the function of uh, tribune, of articulating points of view that the government cannot and will not articulate, but is willing to have articulated because these points of view, while dissenting, are not destabilizing. And the, what in fact has happened is that the in 1997 and since then, the regime has constructed a kind of large and multicolored hedge around the playing field of Algerian politics with a, a variety of dissenter parties, each of which has to do battle with a rival dissenter from the, for the same particular constituency of dissent. So a lot of the energy, as I said earlier, of the dissenters, they're dissenting from each other or they're dissenting from prior versions of their own form of dissent. In other words, they are basically having to devote a lot, if not most, of their energy to each other rather than to the regime. And this is a perfect fix, if you think about it, from the point of the regime. Uh, it occupies, it's, it drains the energies, it provides outlets, if you like, for the energies uh, of all and sundry. Uh, and it actually means that no progress is possible to, at all towards accountable government, towards real democracy. If by real democracy you mean a system where the population is actively and effectively represented, uh, and uh, therefore where, because there is effective representation, public opinion is brought to bear on the government in a, in a serious way that actually has discernible effects on policy decisions. None of that happens because of this sort of periphery or penumbra to the, uh, the regime uh, of organized dis dissent in 57 varieties that maintains public opinion in a state of confusion. And insofar as that confusion has been resolved, it's been resolved in the direction of disenchantment with party politics altogether, a withdrawal <coughs> from it, a refusal to vote, and a decision to engage in direct action whenever there is an issue on which direct action seems to be uh, a rational thing to do. And that is precisely why we're getting all these riots. The riots are not really, in one sense they're political, in, one, in another sense they're not political. Most of the riots are about things such as the fact that our village is not being supplied with gas or electricity or water. There's a, there's a, there's a temporary problem, the authorities are doing nothing. This is about getting the authorities' attention. What do we do? 
we establish a roadblock. We hold up traffic on the nearest national road until the local authorities get their act together and, send and tell us that they've got the message and they're going to do something about it. In other words, these are rational, purposeful uh, forms of direct action that are, of course, forms of civil disobedience, uh, but understood by the regime for the most part as being a useful thing, a way of ringing, uh, 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 in a reasonable fashion, an alarm bell signaling a problem that the regime has to deal with. And the general scenario is the regime is not brutal in dealing with these riots. It may arrest a few people for form's sake, it may beat someone up, but it usually addresses the problem uh, and deals with it. And that Algerian society, noticing that this is going on, of course, then engages in widespread emulation. This is a model that works. It's a form of behavior that yields dividends, and therefore it's copied all over the country. But it expresses the refusal of the population to place any trust in parties as a form of political mediation or political representation. As such, the regime is perfectly happy with this because it doesn't want the parties to perform those functions either. In a sense, you have a situation where the society and the state are both, in, in effect, in, objectively speaking, in agreement. The parties are a waste of time. They're useless. They're irrelevant. So we bypass them. The state bypasses the parties. The society bypasses the parties. And the parties don't know what to do about it. And this is where I come to the final sentence of my very protracted... Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. I have gone on for 50, over 50 minutes. There is a form, and this is uh, the last page of my long... Uh, I, won't, I won't bore you with it. There is a form that nobody has called for in Algeria. Um, and that is the reform that would actually, uh, in my view, open up entirely new political horizons. And that is a reform giving real powers of decision to the national parliament. One of the reasons why uh, the parties that are not in government have nothing to show for their political activity once they've won a certain quota of seats, 15, 20, whatever it is, uh, is that Parliament really decides nothing anyway. So once getting, a, getting some seats in Parliament doesn't then lead to any noticeable and measurable form of purposeful activity that they can then go back to the electorate and say, look what we've done with the mandate you gave us. Because they've done nothing. And the premise of that is that Parliament actually performs simply a rubber stamp function. Uh, and um, to use the, the vocabulary of Walter Badger, it has a dignifying function. There is the efficient part of the Algerian constitution, and then there's the dignifying part. Uh, and parliament, uh, in other words, is part of the mise-en-scene, it's part of the, the legitimation uh, apparatus, but it's not where decisions are taken. Because it's not where decisions are taken. None of the major interests in Algerian society bother with it. They all go straight to the executive power and secure access to the executive power at some level, this ministry, that ministry, the presidency if possible, and of course army generals as well. Uh, so the real system of representation in Algeria actually is within the executive branch in the wider sense, the bureaucracy, the civil service, the armed forces, the intelligence services. That's where the real political game of competitive representation is played. And parliament is irrelevant, and, 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 and in a sense uh, a snare and, an, and, a, and a delusion. Uh, and the point is that, that I want to make, and the reason why I regard the opposition parties not as a real opposition, but as buttresses of the status quo, you might think that they would have worked this out and would have recognized that they have to make Parliament a place of real decision-making for it to be a place of real representation so that their own activity would actually be worthwhile and recognize as such. Not one of the parties outside government, let alone those in government, have at any point made an issue of the fact that Parliament doesn't really have any powers of decision. Whereas, in my view, it is the absolutely crucial precondition of any serious political development in Algeria in the direction of the rule of law, in the direction of democracy, the direction of representative government. But not one of these parties has at any point said, we want our Parliament to have real powers. Not the whole power, just some real powers. It could be a, there could be a, a sharing with the presidency, with the prime minister and so on, but some matters to decide genuinely for itself. And the failure of the parties to, to raise this demand, and there's a failure also of the CNCD, they've never raised it, is, in my view, evidence that none of these 
organizations or personalities are in the business of actually really opposing the political status quo in Algeria. They have discourses that are critical of it, but that criticism is actually part of the game. It's an adaptation to the status quo that in no way threatens it and in no way offers a way of transcending it. Thank you for listening.